making a graphic adventure game, do's and don't, that's the name of the lecture of today. And let's go with it. First, I, want to, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Hernan Lopez. I have like 10 years of making games. I will be doing games for 10 years next month. Uh, I develop a lot of games for browser, uh, for browser, for mobile, for PC, and now we are porting our games to Xbox. Uh, I'm an international speaker, that's why I'm here giving a lecture. I'm a terrible magician, and I can prove it. I, mean, I have cards and all. Who doesn't like magic tricks? Everyone hates them, but. It comes with the best. If you have a best, you, you have to... Yeah, it's, it's weird. Uh, and uh, I developed Darkest Little Castle, right? And uh, next button, yes. About Darkest Little Castle, Darkest Little Castle is a graphic adventure game that is kind of like Monkey Island with a pinch of uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, it has um, plus seven hours of gameplay. It has 2D art style and it's fully voice acted. Also, it's available in English, Russian, and Spanish. It won several awards, including the best game narrative here in Castle Connect uh, 2016. In Amsterdam, it has 97% of positive reviews on Steam. It has a score of 8. And it's on PC and Mac, and it's now being ported to mobiles. And it's about to be ported to Xbox. We got that approved already, so cool. Now, let's, what, what do we learn about uh, making Darkest Field Castle? Well, reading, if, if you want to make uh, a graphic adventure game, if you are reading like a, a seven hour game, uh, you are going to, to be reading like 300 page book. We download the, the format for a book in Amazon, and we put the script there, and it was 300 plus pages. So you are basically reading a not short book. I mean, it's, it, it's not the longest of the book, it's not Harry Potter, but you will be reading like a lot. The hours of, of dialogue that you will put in a graphic adventure game, if your graphic adventure games want to be fully voiced, will multiply extremely when you uh, do it voice act, right? Uh, every minute that the uh, actor uh, says, it will multiply by like 10 when you are editing it, when you are labeling the, the audio, when you are selecting the right, <clears throat> the right uh, line. All objects on the, on the scene are, are configured one by one, so it's a lot of, of work, of micromanagement, of selecting everything. It's, it's really a, a, a handmade game, you know? Everything is done one by one. Character designs are unique. It's not like you make a, a, an enemy in, in other games. You make an enemy and you just repeat the enemy like a trillion times. Here, every character is unique. It requires a lot of animation and it requires a lot of variety on effects. And you will be doing a lot of that, of that entry. Our game is 4,000 and 900 lines of dialogue. So that is 4,900 lines of code that you have to copy and paste. 4,000 4, files of sound that you have to put there. So, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. So now, let's go with the tips that you will need to make this game. Do. When you are starting to make a graphic adventure game, set the tone and vision of the game that you are doing, right? It's going to be comedy, it's going to be terror, it's going to be mystery, it's going to be a retro game. What, what's the tone? Set it in the, in the beginning of the game, yeah? It will help you a lot. Know your references. When you are making a game, you have to know what are you referencing. You are not making a, a, a story or a game ex nihilo, out of nothing. You, you have consumed a lot of products, you have uh, watch a lot of TV series, you have watched a lot of games, you have taken the elements for your story from different references. Maybe you don't know it. If you don't know it, you should know what is the reference that you are taking when you are taking the story that you are making. Okay? For instance, 
We know that we are like trying to make a game kind of like Monkey Island with a touch of uh, Tim Burton in there. So it helps a lot. It helps to define the mechanics of the game. You just take the mechanics from Monkey Island. Uh, it helps you to get the ball rolling. You start to like do the story of the game. When you have a, a problem, you know where to look for the solution. You just look to your references. And it, also, it helps you to define an audience. The same people that consumed the references that you are using, probably, if you make it good, will consume also the product that you made. Well, another do. Set the basic pre premise of the game. For instance, in our case, it was a demon meet a group of demon hunters that are trying to hunt him. So you have a, 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 a loosely, loosely defined premise. And then you start to develop it. Then you divide it in beginning, middle, and end. Then you subdivide this by chapters. If your game doesn't have chapters, there's no problem. But in the structure of the game, it's good to have a, a, the game made in chapters because in graphic adventure games, you go to solving a problem, then solving a problem, then solving a problem, then solving a problem. So this makes the, the, the chapter structure by itself. And also subdivided by puzzles. The, these chapters are made out of little puzzles that make the, the, the story complete. Another two, the main, char the main character should be likable. It's the worst thing that you, the, the player will be stuck with this, with this guy that you made a lot. It, all the time, the only thing that he will, not the only, but a lot of time he will just hear in the voice or just read in the dialogue of this character. See? So the thing that you should do is uh, try to do it that have uh, some kind of affinity with your audience, uh, the, the that share some moral values. Not all, but some moral values, some taste. And it has to have maybe some flaws that the audience should also have. The character should be motivated. He, ha he has to have a direction where to go. He's doing something because he wants to achieve something, so it has to be very clear. And if you are going to do the game voice, uh, with voice acting, choose a voice that is cool to hear. When we started making Darkest Field Castle, we first selected a voice that was like, kind of like Skeletor. It was really funny, but after hearing it for more than 20 minutes, you want to kill the guy. It was like, Meh! all the time, and, and, it, and it's kind of uh, annoying. It, it's good for the first 10 minutes, but after that, it gets all really quick. So choose a voice that is, is, is cool to hear all the time. And the name is very important. Don't name your, your if you are making a, a, a game that is all about uh, terror and mystery and, uh, and it's everything creepy, don't name your guy Bob or, or, or Charleston or something like that. Put a name, it, the name of the character is almost as important as the name of the game because people will be rever referencing it a lot. So, also do. Make graphics of the puzzles that you will be doing so your team can understand better what is going on. Let me check. L let me show what, uh, what I'm trying to say here. For instance, there. You got a graphic of the interlude of the game. Yes, you, you can see the first thing that, uh, that the guy do there is like he find a multi-bit screwdriver. Oh, uh, 10 minutes. Uh, then uh, he needs a scriber bit. And in the red, you can see that the, the red areas are the, red, the areas you, that you can access yet. But down there, you have like two more small puzzles that open the, the, those areas. And following this graphic, the programmer knows what he should do. The, the guy who makes the graphics knows how everything will be laid out. And you know exactly what's the, the roadmap that the player is going to follow to solve this puzzle. So this kind of graphics helps like a lot. When you are making this kind of games, keep localization in mind from the very start. Yes, we we didn't know about we didn't think about localization when we started making Dark Souls Castle. So then we have to make a patch to be able to do uh, to do localization easy. But it takes it took us like a week or something of work. If you start the game thinking about okay, when I change this variable, all the dialogues are going to switch to this other language, you're going to save a lot of time. 
And in graphic adventure games, localization is very, very important. So keep, an, keep that in mind. Also, if you are making comedy, think about when you make uh, uh, puns that are like language related, try to avoid them. Don't. Don't forget that the, the most important thing in a graphic adventure is an engaging story. Logical puzzles and a good length with price, uh, length price relation. Yes? So you have to keep the, the, the story that you are making, it has to have some hooks, something that keep the playing, the, the, the player playing. It has to be, uh, to have uh, puzzles that make sense, uh, something that people hate a lot if when they feel, they, if, if the puzzle don't make much sense, they will feel cheated. They would comment that, okay, I was trying everything with everything and suddenly I was able to, to solve the problem, but it, it wasn't fun. And also, well, as I tell, a good length. If, if the game is, lengthy, is, is, is long, you can make it uh, more expensive and if it's short, it, you have to make it like, cheaper. Don't leave too much generic, can do that line. That's, that's really, really important. People hate to, when they try to talk something, just receive a, no, I can do that. I, you want to try to grab something, no, I can do that. The player will be hearing the, that a lot because he's, he's going to try to do everything. So don't forget to justify why he cannot do that. Okay, he, he wants to grab a, a piano. No, he can do that because it's too heavy. But try something more inventive that is too heavy to carry around. You know, like, uh, no, I, I, I'm not in the mood for a piano lesson or something, you know. Try to be inventive. Try to give the, the, the player some hint, something about the character there every time that they try something. So instead of becoming something frustrating, it becomes something cool to hear. Uh, don't leave incorrect valid solutions to problem unattended. Incorrect valid solution. What do I mean when I say incorrect valid solution? Is that, for instance, you have to burn something in the game. You have a torch that was the, the, the item that you think that the player should use, but you also have a lighter. And the player wants to use the lighter and makes totally sense to use the lighter to, to burn something. But since you didn't think the puzzle that way, eh, he cannot do that and he will feel eh, totally cheated. So if you are going to leave those items there, you have to give, again, a good excuse why the lighter isn't effective there. See? Also, uh, the artists tend to have a lot of liberties, so they make details that you don't think about them, and suddenly you find a, a hammer in the background that ruins everything in your game because the guy just decided to put a hammer there. And, and, and if you, and there is a hammer there, the player will try to, to grab it and use it. So try to delete everything that isn't on the script and if it will stay there, give a good excuse why he cannot use it or why he can't grab it. Don't write annoying characters. There's the worst thing that you can do is make a character that talks slow, that it's boring, it, it, it will drag the game a lot. Even if it's a minor character, try to avoid boring, slow characters at all costs. They are the keys of death. And don't forget to give everyone in your team a perfect and clear briefing on, on what they should do and how the scene should look and how the items should act and you will be saving a lot of your lovely time. So, some extra tips to, to make a good uh, curve, difficulty curve in a graphic adventure games. You, I, I see this as there are like three dimensions. The first dimension is Chinese, if Chinese puzzles together, like, you know, he has, he has to grab an item, to use an item, to be able to open a door. That will be a chain. Then you, have, you can have multiple t puzzles going on at the same time that, that mess up a bit the inventory of, of, our, of our player. So you have this chain and you have parallel chains alongside this. That will be like a second dimension. And suddenly you have the third dimension, you have to be really, really careful with this one that is the clever usage of item or the secondary use of an item. For instance, if the player has to show a ping pong ball to enter a club, and you, the solution for that is that the player 
grab an egg, a white egg, and show the egg to the people, and he looks like a ping pong ball, let's suppose. That would be like, okay, it, it could work, but it, it's not a, the, the, the design item that was meant to be used. Uh, that, that's what I, I mean when going in the clever research of item seat uh, axis. That can be really tricky because if you go too further, uh, people will feel that you are cheating them because the game makes no logic at all. So you have to be very careful how far you go. But if you want to make a, a graphic adventure that becomes gradually harder, keeping this in mind, it, it's, it's a good metric to, to measure that you are making the game harder, harder, and harder. Now, about characters. Flower car flowered characters are much more interesting than just uh, boring, flat, perfect, pristine character. That's why people used to love uh, Batman over Superman, because this, uh, all Superman, he, he was like super cool, he can do everything, but Batman is just a regular dude, dressed as a bat that has a lot of daddy issues and stuff like that. So, also, stereotypes make your characters easy to get, so don't be afraid of stereotypes, because that's what a player can get instantly. Okay, this is the the kind of uh, funny Mexican guy. He's like, he's the talkative kind of, of guy. He's like, you know, stereotypes are, are really good to to keep the, the rhythm flowing, but twist are what make your characters unique and memorable. So don't forget to give your characters something that make them special using a, a stereotype as a base. Also, extra tip. Make to, to keep the ball rolling, if you are having troubles writing characters, set a character bios, uh, write what they love, what they hate, what relation have to each other, what uh, goals they have. You can Google about it. You will find a lot of this kind of spreadsheet that will give you all the kind of items that a character should have. Also, let the player experience this story. That's very important. Don't, don't give them cinematics and good scenes, just leave them learn by themselves. When a, a, a chapter in, in Darkestville cast start, the player don't know what to do. He has to just start walking and talking with people, and they learn that, for instance, they have to open a chest. But the, the game doesn't start that, okay, I should open this chest because someone is hiding here. So try to take control of the character the minimum possible and let the player play. And, uh, but it's a lot of trouble, but then again, it's a lot of fun. When you're doing uh, and you see the public enjoying the game, it's stupidly addictive. You keep like refreshing uh, YouTube all the time, checking what the, the reaction of the YouTubers, if they, if they have fun in the parts that you want to, to, to be funny, if they were puzzles in the part that you want to make them like think, hmm, what, what should I do? That's great. So, even if it's a lot of work, I really encourage you to do a graphic adventure games. And if you have any question, this is the moment. Hi. Hi. Um, any tips for working with voice actors? With voice actors, yes. Uh, try to make, first, find good voice actors. You will be, I know it's like, uh, it's obvious, but you don't uh, take the first guy that comes to you telling you, I am a voice actor, I want, to do so, uh, I want to work with you because that's not good. Hire professional voice actors. That will be the first thing that I, that I will tell you. And uh, try to follow them in the, in the sessions. Don't let them like, record and send you the files. The best thing that you can do is arrange uh, a date, even if it's via Skype. When you hear the guy selling the lines and you give direction to him on how to deliver. Also, it's very important to keep a schedule. Uh, try to keep a schedule about it because uh, voice actors are actors and actors tend to be like really, if they are freelancers, they tend to be really, really uh, messy about their, 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 their schedule. So try to keep them on track. How do you manage artists? Uh, by being behind them and checking what they do. It's kind of like the same because uh, artists are, are, are really artsy. <laughs> so if you leave them be, uh, that what I, I'm saying is, is terrible, but if you let them be, they will do, they will change everything in like two days. If you give them a briefing, you look away, 
and suddenly the game has a lot of, of items that were not supposed to be there. So you have to be try, you have to let them be, to be creative, but you cannot leave them uh, put all the art that they want in there. That, does this answer your question or? Also with motivation, a lot of uh, designers, for example, I've worked with, a lot of them like flake out or are late or give uh, wrong estimations of time. It's just something I've noticed a lot personally, yeah. so I'd love, because there's so much art in your games and you have so yes, much experience. Yes, it is a lot, yeah, you, I mean, yeah, you have to motivate them, they, they, do, a, they do a great job, I mean, you, you have to, they, they like to be like pet, <laughs> you know, like you, you have to be uh, gentle when you give feedback to, to an artist, but, but yeah, you have to not let them fly too much, because otherwise it will end messy for you, for your, for your game.